I have to say, back to back recordings are exhausting. Yeah, Ravi, you are getting a window into a unique experience, which is a complete lawfare freakout when the FBI raids the president's house. You can tell because my hair and Alan's hair has both gotten progressively more vertical over the course of the last three hours. That's also true of my hair. Excuse you. You've got a nice flow, though. Alan and I have a certain, like, completely untamed chaos that's hard to rival. Alan's beating me at this point because he's been a little more engaged on this. I feel really bad for you three. It's, yeah. it's been it's been a time. I'll I'll say that much. I have to assume, Ravi, that it was it was not so different for you when Russia invaded Ukraine. I mean, there must be like for every publication, there must be certain things where it's like, cool, I'm not doing anything for the next 72 hours except this. Well, or longer. I mean, you feel like there are things that happen in your working lives where, you know, you mentally write off an indefinite period of time. And this is obviously that for you, <laughs> my commiserations, but also exciting. I mean, this is what we... We live for and what we do our, our jobs for. But um, yeah, I guess in my case of foreign policy, uh, different types of stories. Uh, my vision of this is Robbie Gramer, like desperately sweating through his cardio and glasses. Uh, Jack Dutch is pounding Red Bulls in the back, just trying to stay awake. <laughs> I can kind of see all my foreign policy friends and how they are freaking out in their own unique way. Most of them I have never met in person. I've only talked to on the phone. No, but your visualization of them is exactly correct. It's exactly what, what, only they, imagine. what they are doing. Cardigans and Red Bull. I like that combination. Yeah, that's kind of how I live my 20s, if I'm being honest. No cardigans in the lawfare office today. It was mostly just a bunch of me running back and forth yelling, Ben! (laughs) (laughs) Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rational Security 2.0, a.k.a. Rational Security World Tour. Uh, because we are very excited to be joined today by we, of course, I mean me, Scott R. Anderson, one of your regular co-hosts, with my two other co-hosts, Alan Rosenstein. Hello. And Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And we are thrilled to be joined by a true man of the world, uh, a man who covers the world and knows much about the world, editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine, the magazine about the world, Ravi Agrawal. Ravi, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hello. We are thrilled to have you. Uh, it is uh, rare that we get, you know, somebody who is their foot so truly in a, another journalistic avenue to come and join us and talk about our increasingly absurd podcast. We think of this as our kind of dark underbelly of our journalistic enterprise, and yet we've dragged you down with us somehow. Oh, it's a joy to be in the dark underbelly. Seriously, good to be on with you three. This is the crossover episode that everyone has been waiting for of the decade. <laughs> Of the decade. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we are very excited to have you here for what we are calling the very model of a modern major general edition uh, in honor of one of the stories we'll be talking about, because it has been one heck of a week on the national security front and the national security law front. Uh, And we have a couple topics we want to talk over, one of which is it particularly in your lane. We're excited to get your perspective on before you have to step away. We'll warn warn the listeners now. Ravi's going to be with us for just the first segment, but it's one that he has a lot to share with us on. Our topics for today are topic one, can strategy. The war in Ukraine and tensions over Taiwan have led the Biden administration to further revise its long overdue national security strategy, which it now says it intends to release in the fall. What do we already know about Biden's grand strategy? How should we be evaluating it? Topic two, Mar-a-Lago, my federal records. Yesterday, the FBI executed a search of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate, reportedly in search of classified documents that Trump retained in violation of federal records laws. How serious a step is this and what does it mean for the broader universe of investigations surrounding Trump and his associates? And topic three, Millie, not so vanilla. A shocking new report details former President Trump's contentious relationship with his generals, including a particularly contentious relationship with his chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, that has some experts concerned about the state of civil military relations. Were Milley and the other generals out of line? Is there reason to be concerned moving forward? Quinta, I'm going to hand it over to you to get us started on our first topic. So as you mentioned, Scott, it has been not just a a busy day, a busy week, a busy few months, a busy year when it comes to national security issues. And we have long been expecting a national security strategy from the Biden administration, and it has repeatedly uh, failed to show up. There's an interesting piece in Defense News explaining how uh, folks in Congress are 
irked by this. Most of the quotes seem to be from Republican members of Congress and staffers, but from an institutional perspective, I would say it's certainly fair for Democrats to be irritated as well. This is something that Congress you know, expects from the administration, and they've kind of been slow walking it. I think part of that, um, as you have said, Scott, is that, you know, there's been a lot in flux. The White House has kind of indicated that part of this has to do with the fact that uh, the war in Ukraine began and they had to sort of reorient what they're doing around that. There's also an interesting piece on this subject recently in the the New York Times uh, by reporter Edward Wong kind of suggesting that, you know, for all that Biden really positioned himself as a contrast to Trump on the campaign trail, that the Biden administration's foreign policy has not been perhaps as different from Trump's as we might have expected. Um, perhaps different in in uh, style and level of bombast, but substantively not quite so distinct. So I'll say what I always say, which is that there's a lot to dig into here, both on the sort of the question of where is the national security strategy and when should we expect it? And on this question of, you know, is it right to say that Biden is perhaps a little bit more uh, chip off the block of the Trump administration than we'd expected. Um, Ravi, I'll turn it over to you first. I'm curious what you think on either one of those questions. Well, I'll take the first one first, Quinta, and really it's a pleasure to be on with the three of you. Um, but, you know, on the national security strategy, you're right. I mean, and I, I saw that piece in Defense News as well. Foreign policy has done some reporting on this too. Um, but there is general frustration that it's taken so long for the Biden administration to come out with a, a national security strategy document that, of course, uh, is also delaying a larger national defense strategy. And all of this in the queue, it sort of holds up a bunch of things. Uh, the reason why uh, the administration needs it, government needs it, America needs it is, you know, several reasons. But it sort of helps lawmakers in Congress weigh um, White House security priorities for budgeting. Um, it allows government officials to speak with a single voice you'd expect on national security matters. And in general, I mean, this is historic practice um, for governments to do. So you'd, you'd expect them to come up with a document in their defense. The government, as you say, has said that there's a war underway. Um, that is something that, of course, makes it harder for them to uh, be able to triangulate what exactly uh, the broader strokes of policy are. And also the fact that, of course, from a budgeting standpoint, none of the uh, giant sums of money that America's had to sort of put towards supporting the war in Ukraine were anticipated, let's say, this time last year. So there's that as well in their defense. Now, all of that said, while we don't know exactly what's going to be in uh, the strategy document when it is released, we do know what the larger strategy itself might be. And, and I think that sort of gets at the other point you were alluding to about how different Biden's strategy is from Trump's. And, you know, even just 45 days into the Biden administration's start, they released an interim uh, national security strategic guidance document. And it, it's quite striking if you look back at it today, and I actually pulled it up uh, as I was thinking about um, today's podcast. But if you go through it again, you'll see that so many of the things they mention are actually exactly what they've set out to do. So an emphasis on alliances, for example, quote unquote, revitalizing democracy, building back better at home, focusing on the American middle class interests, defending human rights, all of these things that they signaled just 45 days into uh, the start of their administration are all, in a sense, the things that the Biden administration is doing, rightly or wrongly. And what, what I would like to discuss in a sense, Quinta, is whether these things all add up. And, and I think the jury is out because there are many contradictions within all of these things I just mentioned, alliances, revitalizing democracy, foreign policy for the middle class, defending human rights. Something has to give. And we've seen that play out over just the last few months. Yeah, so let me turn to, to Scott on that, because Scott, I'm curious for, for your thoughts, too. I mean, is there an, are there inconsistencies there between those different priorities? Well, I, that's kind of the big question. And Ravi, as somebody who spent so much more time, you know, watching the different elements of the Biden administration's policies play out in different domains, you know, I really want to get your sense of this. But my sense of it that there's like a lot of kind of inconsistency or at least mixed prioritization about this. You know, we see the Biden administration talk a lot of language about human rights from the outset. 
I'm not sure we've seen a substantively that different policy on human rights. Uh, you know, it, certainly there's a lot of engagement about it, re-engagement with international institutions, but it's not clear it's a massive new priority. It's more that it's been restored to a position that the Trump administration probably diminished it a bit from. But, you know, we've seen re-engagement with Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, there's no major shift around a human rights-based agenda that we can see. Um, we've seen continued engagement with the government of Israel, despite concerns even within the Democratic Party in the Democratic Party platform about human rights issues in regard to the Palestinians. The Biden administration, if anything, appears to be uh, less inclined to engage that than other members of the party. Then we see a lot of talk just in very realist terms. You know, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was the idea that this is not in our interests. And even though it's going to have terrible consequences, although the administration was a little late to acknowledge those consequences, even though it's going to have terrible consequences, they would defend what they did, saying it wasn't in U.S. interest and we have to move away from it. Then you have China, another case where we've seen Biden himself be in some tension with his own advisors. You know, we've seen the National Security Council walk back Biden's own statements implying that he would go to the defense of Taiwan to try and water that down a bit to say, no, in fact, we're trying to walk, can maintain this kind of strategic ambiguity about what we're going to do. Whether that's a deliberate slip or an inadvertent slip is a little unclear, something we've talked about in the podcast. So, I mean, that's, that's for me, is a big question. Like, is the value of this document that it really translates and guides policy? Is it that it's the product of the consensus of the sort of the administration can come to among the different people who have inputs here? And are, should we really be expecting a super coherent brand strategy moving forward? Or does foreign policy really get made, you know, through the muddy process of making policy, through compromises, training off different interests and priorities that don't often come together towards into one strategic vision in a way that can easily be boiled down into a document? Those are a great set of points. I mean, I think, you know, the the document, when it does emerge, is, is not really going to surprise us that much. I think, you know, in a sense, what it does is it provides fodder for discussion. It allows officials to sort of sing off the same song sheet, as it were. It'll make some budgetary concerns easier. But the broad strokes, I think, you know, we're halfway through this administration already. The broad strokes have emerged. I don't think much is going to change. We know what we're going to get for the next two years, and it's going to be more of the same. I, I don't even see them course correcting uh, in any significant way. But, you know, to latch on to one of the things um, you were saying, there are indeed some very real inconsistencies in even the interim um, strategy document that we've seen. So, you know, Numerous times we've seen officials from from the, from this administration come out and say they want to build a foreign policy for the middle class. We've seen them say they want to center human rights, and we've seen them say they want to align democracies against autocracies. Now, if it's the latter two, so align democracies against autocracies, uh, center human rights, then you don't want to meet the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. You don't want to be seen fist bumping MBS. But then again, if you care about centering the American middle class and their interests, then it is important to think about the price of crude. And then yes, you do have to do business with, with dictators around the world. And OPEC is an oil cartel. Many of its member countries are you know, unpleasant uh, sort of leaders to have to be seen shaking hands with. That's just the way the world works. And so in a sense, you know, the chickens that are coming home to roost here are the inconsistencies in some of the rhetoric that we've seen so far from the Biden administration. Now, all of this said, and I did also read the Edward Wong piece, Quinta, that you referred to earlier, and many others have written about this as well. Uh, you know, Mike Hirsch at uh, Foreign Policy, uh, James Traub as well. Many of our writers have taken this on, this notion that Biden is not that different from Trump. And I think where I diverge from all of those takes is, you know, at their very core, these two people could not be more different. And their foreign policies at their core are also about as poles apart as you could imagine. And the reason is that much as though I'm criticizing discrepancies in rhetoric, rhetoric does matter. I mean, if you ask... For example, David McCullough, rest in peace. You know, uh, I remember meeting him a decade ago and asking him, you know, what defines a great American president? And he said, speech, rhetoric, you know, being able to sort of uplift people, being able to say the right things, being able to cry with them, being able to inspire, being able to offer hope. 
And I have to say, on that front alone, Biden is such an improvement over Trump. I'm not even American. I don't have a sort of a Democratic or Republican sort of bone to pick in this this whole fight. But but what is clear is that you know when Biden speaks, if you are say uh, living in India or the UK or Germany or Nigeria, you're gonna you're gonna listen to him and say, well, this is a person that we can see eye to eye with. We can do business with them. The rhetoric is so different without even having to remind our listeners of, of the many things Trump has said about, say, the Muslim world, for example, countries in the global south. I think those are things that that rankle and that countries remember. So even though some things haven't changed in terms of, say, policy with China, there really is a sea change. And that's important. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to extend what, what Ravi is saying. I, I I admit, I will find the I find the argument that Biden is mostly just continuing Trump's foreign policy to be a very strange one. And, and I think it reflects one of the many unfortunate features of Donald Trump, which is that he is such an extreme character across all the dimensions that um, there's the sense, I think, or you can fall into this, I think, fallacy that unless you then do the opposite of every single thing he has done, you are somehow a continuation of him. But look, stop, you know, this, the cliche that a stopped clock is right twice a day is a cliche for a reason. And, you know, the blob, which I actually don't even mean to use pejoratively, is a real thing. And therefore, it obviously will um, channel the discretion of even the most weirdo president like Donald Trump in certain obvious directions. You know, when it comes to, for example, to China, the people are making a, a big deal of the fact that we are still in a op oppositional antagonistic relationship with China, as, as if there was a, a real possibility that in 2022, we were all going to be the best of friends. I can't imagine any president uh, being on particularly good terms with China. You know, would the tariff situation be a little different? Maybe, maybe not. But I, I don't see that as a very meaningful piece of evidence. And there's just an enormous piece of evidence on the other side of the ledger, which is, of course, the United States response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, in which the Biden administration's response not only, and this is to Ravi's point, just on a technical level of not starting World War III was pretty impressive, and on a technical level of you know the much maligned leading from behind a little bit with respect to Europe and all of that sort of stuff, really masterfully done diplomacy. But in the amount of weapons being sent to Ukraine, the strong rhetoric against Russia, the freezing of Russian central bank assets, the bringing in of uh, uh, Sweden and Finland into NATO, which is an enormous deal, right? Something we're not going to talk about, you know, in particular on this episode, just because of the sheer amount of things that have happened over the last week. But that's a remarkable accomplishment, as is the 95 to 1 uh, vote in the Senate to ratify the Ascension Treaty. I mean, all of these things to me are just massive amounts of evidence that it's just completely different. And, you know, honestly, whether you're on the left or the right, you know, you should be thankful every single day that the commander in chief is no longer Donald Trump. You know, part of the issue with comparing Trump and Biden is that what that essentially is uh, on foreign policy is you're trying to find a through line within Biden's foreign policy, which is hard enough. And then you're trying to compare that to a through line through Trump's foreign policy, and good luck doing that. There is no through line. It, I mean, we had perpetual whiplash trying to make sense of, of how it all added up and what it meant. And as did, I would imagine, most of his team. So in that sense, the comparison is a really tough one to make. But, you know, th there is one other sort of big thing that's changed between sort of, say, five or six years ago and now, and that is the scenario outside America. So you know, with each passing year, China is a, a stronger adversary. With each passing year, um, there are countries around the world, which, so think of India, think of Nigeria, think of Indonesia, think of, you know, large countries in the global south with large populations. There are many of those countries that look at an emerging giant tussle between America and China, and then they go, hmm, where do I fit into this? And the big difference, again, with each passing year, like 20 years ago, you could make the case that, you know, for, for say, a country like India, they needed to care more about America and they wanted to sort of shift their uh, allyship to America more and stay away from Russia to some extent 20 years ago, in part because they didn't have to worry that much about a peer like China. China is no longer a peer for India. China's economy is five times the size of India's. 
China is one of India's biggest trading partners. And the same goes, pick your country anywhere in the global south and the likelihood that both America and China would be among their top five trading partners is extremely high. And so in a world that is now increasingly watching with bated breath, like how this giant superpower tussle is going to play out, I think that's the more interesting thing to now examine, not only for the Biden administration, but for for future administrations, in that how do you get the rest of the world to align more closely with the West than with, say, China, or you know, to take this year's story with Russia? Um, remember, again, much of the global South has abstained from trying to sanction Russia, in large part because they would rather be buying cheap Russian oil. Um, they would rather preserve that alliance that they have with Russia. They would rather return to sort of the era of the non-aligned movement because they don't want to pick between great powers. So I think that will be an emerging challenge um, for the Biden administration, for for succeeding administrations. And it's an issue that doesn't get talked about enough in America. Well, Ravi, we are so thrilled you're able to join us, but we will excuse you as we move on to our next topic, because we've been talking about one president withholding records, but there's another president who's been withholding some other documents that we need to talk about. Nicely done. Thank you. I've been working on that one for a while. As we turn our eyes to the South, to the beautiful state of Florida, a state that has been in a lot of national security news lately, for those who have been paying attention, we got news of a pretty big investigatory development. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has launched a raid on former President Trump's residence at his Mar-a-Lago estate slash club in Florida, outside of Palm Springs, I think, if I recall correctly, in search of an array of, according to reports, classified documents, I'm not sure this is completely verified yet, that he is alleged to have retained or potentially suspected to have retained after leaving the White House in violation of a variety of federal records, retention laws and associated laws. But of course, there's the possibility that the investigation may have been motivated by something more broadly, uh, including the broader January 6th investigation and 2020 election interference investigation that we know is ongoing and that we've seen a few reports come out of the Justice Department and elsewhere noting that it is heating up now that the January 6th committee has finished at least its first phase. Quinta, let me turn it to you first to get us started on this topic. This is obviously a fast-moving issue. Uh, We are recording this Tuesday afternoon, uh, so we've got a certain bundle of information. That might change by Wednesday when people hear this recording. Um, So bear that in mind and bear with us, folks. But bring us up to speed on where exactly we are in terms of what we know now. And tell us, as somebody who follows these investigations very closely, how big a deal is this? Uh, In the words of the current president, it is a big effing deal. I think that first off, I'll direct listeners to another podcast that we recorded, a Twitter Spaces conversation that Alan and I recorded with uh, Ben Wittes and one Andrew Weissman of former Mueller investigation and Enron fame. I think that this is not, frankly, a step that I expected (laughs) Uh, anytime soon. I was pretty flabbergasted when I saw the news. Um, Well, I I should say, well, I was out to dinner at a nice restaurant. So I really blame Trump personally for choosing to announce this to the world on a, a evening that I was taking off. But as you say, Scott, it does seem like this is actually not connected to the January 6th investigation, which is weird. Um, Don't get me wrong. But the New York Times reported just this afternoon, so that's the afternoon of Tuesday, August 9th, that indeed this is sort of running on a separate track from the January 6th investigation, that it is separate. It instead has to do with this sort of long-running background uh, issue that I think had certainly faded out of my consciousness, um, having to do with Trump's taking 15 boxes of material from the White House to Mar-a-Lago when he left office. Um, The Washington Post reported on this in February 2022 that the archives had come to basically scoop those boxes up and take them back to the National Archives where they belonged. Uh, It then later turned out, again, from the Post reporting and serious chops to the Post reporters here, I think they've really owned this story. It then turned out that uh, some of the material was classified, including at top secret levels, um, some potentially TSSCI or TSSAPS. So that is 
pretty serious that there's just classified information floating around at Mar-a-Lago. We then learned in the spring that the Justice Department was investigating, and that basically brings us up to where we are today. So I don't think it's really right to say that this is a kind of, you know, fig leaf for a January 6th investigation step. It does seem like it is kind of separate. Now, I think there are a lot of questions about, you know, you'd want to have a lot of certainty. You'd really want to run the traps on this if you're the Justice Department before you come uh, and show up at the door of Mar-a-Lago with a warrant. And so I think there are certainly questions about like, what do we not know about this classified information that could justify such an incredible step? Um, I should certainly say, you know, I've definitely made my criticisms of of Merrick Garland and the Justice Department leadership right now, but this is actually a circumstance that I think kind of makes the case for why you should want someone at the helm of the department who's really a by the book rule follower kind of guy that, you know, we can sit here and say, we're pretty sure that it wasn't just that, you know, they flew off the handle and decided to go big or go home, right? If it will do it live, whatever, whatever comparison you want to make but rather that this is a situation where department leadership really decided soberly for whatever reason that we don't know that this investigation merited this step. And what it is that merited that is still not clear. That actually is a great setup for a question I want to turn to you on, Alan, as our former Justice Department uh, alumnus, Um, because there's two parts of this that don't make sense to me yet. Uh, although I have some ideas about what might explain it. And I think maybe you're in a better position to give me a sense of, of how the department would think about this. One of those things is that this seems like a weird time to take this investigatory step, given that as far as we know, the revelation that Trump took most of these boxes actually has been in the news for well over a year now. And we saw NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, recover what at the time seemed like all or at least most of these records from Trump pretty early in the Biden administration. And as far as we can tell, kind of more or less voluntarily, it didn't seem like they marched FBI agents in to take it. They showed up. The Trump people said, sorry, shouldn't have taken this. I handed a lot of them back. Obviously, that wasn't everything. But such a long span of time makes me ask, what would trigger this new investigatory step in a story like this? Is it just that they somehow got reports some record is in there? Is it that they're is some concern that something's being done. And the second question I have is, you know, how segregated out does this appear to be from other potential investigations that might be ongoing? We know Trump is kind of at the intersection of a number of investigations, most related to the January 6th or the 2020 election interference, both federal and state, although this is, you know, federal is what we're really concerned with here. I don't think the state of Georgia was hanging out with the FBI uh, as they executed this warrant. What degree of separation does this have in practice from those other investigatory avenues? Yeah, I mean, so there there are a bunch of uh, it's a bunch of good questions. I think the answer to all of them is some version of I don't know, but it's fun to speculate. And this is Ratzek after all. I, I, I will start just by just emphasizing Quintus' point that. And I guess to yours as well, Scott, this was quite unexpected. I'm writing a piece right now on the kind of prudential case for investigating Trump for a different publication. And I submitted a draft and the editor emailed me a week ago saying, <clears throat> you know, do you mind if we run this after our summer break? What do you think the chances of Trump being indicted in August are? And my response was, I'm pretty sure it's about 0%. And then last night I had to email this very awkward, uh, apparently I'm really bad at this. I think it's above 0% now. <laughs> um, so where would you put it? Like 0.1, 0.01? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm done. Like as, as, the great, as the great philosopher Yogi Berra said, Predictions are hard, especially about the future. You know, to answer your question, it's it's very hard to know, Scott, why we're taking this step now. And part of that is because there's an even deeper mystery, which is why are we executing search warrants on the former president's estate for an offense that, while not trivial, right, CEG but her emails uh, and the whole Clinton email fiasco, is not something that ordinarily is dealt with through the criminal process. And in fact, as uh, then FBI Director Jim Comey famously remarked when he issued the verdict about Hillary Clinton's soul uh, back in 2016, um, we think that bad stuff happened, but this is not something any prosecutor would prosecute. Again, we still don't know the answer. I think at this point, there are are two decent theories with respect to um, the question of you know, inappropriate retention of material or or classified material in particular. One is that there are some really bad aggravating factors here. 
And all of these go to, to your question, Scott, of you know, maybe they, they've learned some new information about these aggravating factors, and that's what triggered this search warrant and execution. So what are some of these aggravating factors? What could they be? And again, I want to emphasize I'm totally speculating here, right? But they might be, it's way more information than we realized, or the information was taken um, not out of sloppiness, but with a very malign purpose. What might that malign purpose be? Maybe blackmail, maybe selling to a foreign government. I mean, who the hell knows at this point? Um, but that could be an aggravating factor that would trigger this sort of monumental step. Um, another possibility, and this is uh, this was the idea of, of, of Andrew Weissman on, on the, the recording earlier today, this is very interesting, is that this is less about criminal investigation and more about a recovery mission, as it were. You know, if the Department of Justice discovered that there's particularly sensitive information, right? And who knows what, uh, you know, the president as the commander in chief has access to literally everything. That's kind of the whole point of the classification system. The, the names of agents, military secrets, who knows what else? If those are in Mar-a-Lago, the issue is less about criminally prosecuting Donald Trump, though maybe that's part of it. It's about, we need to get those documents back and the IC might be just losing its mind right now over this fact. So maybe it's a recovery mission. Ultimately, though, we don't know, and, and this is this is a, a real mystery. As to your second question of, you know, how segregated is this from the remainder of the January 6th investigations and, and all that sort of stuff, this is really tricky to know. You know, on the one hand, it's hard to imagine that this is completely segregated for just the following simple reason, or the following simple reasons. Uh, first, just as a general matter of criminal investigations, once you do something like execute a search warrant on someone's house, you are clearly telling that person that they are a target of a fast-moving investigation. And if you're a target of investigation, you don't think just in terms of your exposure on a particular investigation, you think of all the things you might have done. So, you know, just from like a witness tampering, evidence destruction perspective, it's hard to imagine that they would execute a search warrant against Trump without having some parallel, fairly advanced progress in the investigation on the other January 6th issues. In addition, there's a specific reason with respect to Trump why this is the case, which is that an investigation of this sort um, on Trump is predictably, and as we have seen, is causing this complete blowback freak out on the right. And so it would not make a lot of sense, I think, for DOJ to take that sort of blowback just for a charge of mishandling of classified information. If they're going to do that, presumably it's because they're also then willing to move forward on the real stuff, right? Which is the fake elector stuff, uh, the Georgia stuff, the insurrection stuff. This all argues for there not being a wall between this investigation and the January 6th investigations. On the other hand, good criminal procedure practice and also just Merrick Garland being the kind of buttoned up person that he is, it, it seems very unlikely that what DOJ is doing is using this search warrant to try to backdoor investigate all the other stuff. So, you know, I do think ultimately the search warrant has to stand or fall on its own. But yeah, it, it is weird that after, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, it's just weird and we don't know why at the end of all this time, we're taking this unprecedented monumental step over what is fundamentally probably a peripheral issue in the grand scheme of Trump's criminality. I mean, I think it's a good reminder about one of the main principles of the Trump era, which is like, it can always get weirder. So here's my question for you guys about this moving forward. Like, we're going to get more details about the investigation over the next 24, 48 hours. And then like a leak of things as they go on, either because there are developments or information is going to leak. We'll, we'll get some more reporting. I don't know if there's a lot more we can speculate about what's going on now responsibly, except I'll go into deeper detail on these points. Um, but Lord knows we tried this afternoon. So, <laughs> so what about irresponsibly? I bet there's a lot we can do irresponsibly. Sometimes restraining ourselves is a good thing. <laughs> so I want I want to turn to think about the optics and the politics of this because they're unavoidable, right? We've already seen a very, very high, high volume response from Republican leadership, right? We see uh, House Minority Leader McCarthy come out and say, basically, like, the Attorney General Garland needs to be ready to have himself investigated. This is an abuse of power. We see Marjorie Taylor Greene screaming, defund the FBI, uh, which is triggered a lot of pretty great responses on Twitter. It's worth checking out for a variety of people. It's by no means, you know, the entire Republican Party even, uh, but it is a very vocal portion of, you know, leader, the leadership 
certainly the Trump leaning leadership and then the Trump wing of the party. And it's kind of a little bit of a sensitive moment. We know some figures associated with Trump, specifically former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was set supposedly to have a conversation with the January 6th committee about potentially testifying, at least in some capacity or another. How do we think this plays out in those efforts? How does this intersect with efforts to get people to cooperate with the January 6th committee or the general political environment around investigations of Trump and people associated with Trump? Is there a way to frame it or pursue these sorts of steps in ways that have potentially less damaging political ramifications? Quinta, let me start with you on that. So I do think that when we're thinking about the congressional investigation, and in this case, it's actually investigations, because we have both the January 6th committee investigation and the House Oversight Committee has also been investigating the mysterious moving documents. Representative Carolyn Maloney, who's the chair of that committee, has been writing about this, essentially uh, releasing statements saying that they're investigating since the Post came out with its first story. And so what I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that Congress and the Justice Department have different equities. One of the things that Maloney had said in a press statement uh, a few months ago was frustration that she felt like DOJ was stonewalling her, that the committee wasn't getting the information that it needed. And, you know, that is something that you might expect to see if DOJ is conducting an ongoing investigation and doesn't want to hand material over to Congress because it could potentially create problems. And we've seen this kind of sort of back and forth uh, between the branches, also in connection with the January 6th committee investigation and the Justice Department's investigation into January 6th. All of which is to say that I would not be surprised if this new development caused a lot to heat up in Congress as Congress kind of takes the ball and runs with it. That said, I also would not be surprised to see this as, you know, a a moment where perhaps the already not like great relationship between the Justice Department and Congress when it comes to each institution's, you know, protecting its own turf when it comes to these investigations to also, you know, get continue to get contentious because the department doesn't want folks, you know, talking to one another, talking to Congress. They want to keep everything close hold. Congress, uh, has a a long history of screwing up Justice Department investigations, particularly with the Iran-Contra by interviewing people ahead of time. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I want to stick up for DOJ in two ways here, and and not just because I am a product of DOJ. You know, with with respect to the issue of of congressional DOJ relations, and in particular, like January 6th committee DOJ relations, what the January 6th committee has done is incredibly impressive. And I've said that many times that I continue to be incredibly, incredibly impressed But let's not kid ourselves. A federal criminal investigation and prosecution of the president is orders of magnitude harder and more complicated than even the most impressive, and again, very impressive, like major props here, uh, of the January 6th committee. Way more things can go wrong. There are way more technical hurdles. The burdens of proof are far, far higher. The judges will be way more skeptical. I mean, it's just, it's a completely different ballgame. So while I understand why, you know, the committee might not like exactly the order that DOJ is doing it in, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you have the best prosecutors like working on this issue. I think you have to trust that that they're doing the this the way they're doing for for a reason. And the reason is so that if and when United States v. Trump <laughs> proceeds to trial and appeal and then the Supreme Court, DOJ is on the best possible grounds, right? Now, I'm not saying DOJ is infallible, certainly not. Um, but I do think that is one important thing to keep in mind. You know, with respect to the broader question of congressional DOJ relations, or let's be honest here, House DOJ relations come the midterms uh, and the likely, though according to 538, only 80% chance of the uh, GOP takeover in November. And this is to Scott's question, you know, could DOJ do this in a way that was less political and less, you know, annoy Republicans less? And I think the answer is eh, no, right? I mean, I just like these, I God, these people either don't care about democracy at all, and I'd put like Marjorie Taylor Greene in this category, or they're just super cynical. And although they are, would be happy to see Trump gone, uh, they feel the need to throw red meat to the base. And I would put, you know, Marco Rubio uh, in this category. I'd especially put Ron DeSantis, maybe I'd put Ron DeSantis in both of those categories. I just don't see how this was going to do anything but um, infuriate everyone, which is again, why I think, and to me, this is the really big takeaway of this, 
it shows me that Merrick Garland is willing to go all the way toward indicting Donald Trump because he has just ruined his next two years. I mean, he has ruined his life for the next couple of years by doing what he just did. Um, he will be harassed by the House GOP forever for this, um, just for the search warrant. Um, and so I'm not sure he's going to be harassed much more for an indictment. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, Scott, I, I don't know. Scott, Scott, let me ask your question back at you. Like, what could DOJ have done here? So I'm, I, I, I don't disagree. I think DOJ is probably a Approach this right, but I'm not sure I agree with your last point that Garland is inevitably earning the complete ire of the Republican Party moving forward. And I think that actually might explain why this investigatory step is maybe a little easier to swallow than things related to 2020 or January 6, which is that this is a clear binary on an issue, meaning outcome, on an issue that there's pretty bipartisan consensus on. If they go into Trump's office, they find improperly withheld classified documents, particularly ones that might have some national security damaging nexus, that thing that triggered this investigatory step years later. I think it's a lot harder for Republicans to make this a talking point about how it's Biden administration overreach time and time again, because you've got the case saying Trump actually had this, we did find it. And it comes forward. Whereas if you're investigating January 6th, you're investigating 2020 election interference, you're uncovering conversations, you're uncovering records, but none of it's like a smoking gun. This is a place where you actually might get a smoking gun in the form of a classified record, right? That's recovered. And they're still being deranged, though. But like that's I, I totally agree with you on the merits. The problem is like they're losing their minds about this anyway. But I think I think we need to see how the narrative develops at the point where DOJ says, here's what we found. And I don't think that point is that far down the road if they find something. If they don't, then I agree they're kind of screwed and they probably misplayed their hand a little bit. In my mind, that makes it this a much lower hanging fruit than a lot of other investigatory steps and maybe a good canary in the coal mine politically to say, OK, in this kind of best case scenario, we can pretty quickly show pretty hard reasons why we we're just fine to do what we're doing if we're right. This gives us a good sense of saying, well, if we have to take these other steps where it's always just inherently a lot grayer because you're just trying to capture parts of a much bigger, much bigger, much more complex case of criminal conduct, um, what's the tolerance going to be that on a lot of different fronts, politically, you know, public narrative wise, congressionally. And so, you know, that sequencing kind of makes sense to me um, to say, like, there's a reason why if you knew you had these two investigatory strands going forward, this one's maybe easier to swallow. And it kind of makes sense it would go first. I just want to say it's always fun uh, in, in these episodes to see whether it's going to be Scott or me that tries to play devil's advocate of, I don't know, maybe the Republicans are reasonable. And Quinta is just whoever's talking like slowly, like her her head is slowly exploding. It's always a fun, always fun. I, don't, I, I would not say that was my argument. <laughs> that being reasonable. I think, it, I think, it, I think it was that it was, this is a lot harder to pin if they actually walk out with a box full of classified documents. It doesn't matter, oh, man. No. It doesn't uh, matter. Maybe it nothing matters anymore. absolutely does not matter. No, nothing, literally nothing matters. Yeah, LOL, nothing matters. They'll they'll get well, mad about it no matter what happens. It just, yeah, there's just nothing to say. I mean, look, I think that there, we're kind of in a difficult spot here, dear listener, because this insane thing happened and we have to talk about it, but at the same time, we don't know anything but we're not going to, you know, pop off like Andrew Yang and just start saying like random stuff that has no connection with reality. So we're just sitting here saying like, hmm, well, maybe, I don't know, perhaps none of us have any idea what the hell is going on. <laughs> check, check back that's, in a couple that's weeks. That's the fun. That's why we have a podcast. <laughs> Well, we will have to leave this topic for now, but frankly, I am confident we are going to revisit it in multiple formats in weeks to come. Um, but let us go to our third topic. Alan, let me hand it over to you. Yes, from WTF is happening right now to WTF was happening. Um, let's talk about a very interesting article that is in the current issue of The New Yorker. It's an excerpt of a forthcoming book by the excellent reporters uh, Susan Glasser and Peter Baker. The book is called The Divider, Trump in the White House. Uh, the excerpt in the, in the New Yorker focuses on Trump's relationship with the military, especially his senior military leadership. There are a number of just remarkable episodes outlined in the piece, uh, and I'm going to say a couple of them before we get to the main topic of this segment. Uh, so Trump apparently not only wanted the military to stage a kind of tin pot dictatorship style July 4th military parade through D.C., but he also, this is the best part, he wanted to exclude wounded soldiers and veterans because that, quote, wouldn't look good for him. 
Uh, it's a very, very sensitive man, Trump is. Another one, this is actually my favorite part. Uh, Trump apparently kept telling people that he wanted, quote, his generals, I, I love the use of the pronoun there, he wanted his generals to act with the total loyalty to him that Hitler's generals apparently showed Hitler, even though, one, that's not actually how Hitler's generals acted, and two, and perhaps more importantly, I'm pretty sure that when you're the president of the United States, you never want to compare yourself to Hitler. It's like a real self-owning in terms of uh, Goodwin's law. Yeah, it's a self-godwinning. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's self, self-godwinning. But the the main thrust of the article and what we're going to talk about is um, the letter of resignation that Mark Milley, Trump's final and uh, Biden's current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wrote after the Lafayette Square incident. So uh, just as a reminder for listeners, at some point in the summer of 2020, there was a Black Lives Matter protest in Lafayette Square next to the White House. It was uh, forcibly, with some violence, um, you know, certainly tear gas, uh, cleared, um, at which point Trump marched through Lafayette Square. This then ended up with him and the infamous waving of the Bible uh, thing. Uh, but the problem, or there were many problems, but the problem uh, for Milley was that he, for reasons that are not entirely clear, decided it would be a good idea to put on military fatigues and walk behind Trump through this cleared uh, square the optics of which were just the worst. Now, Milley, to his credit, recognized that he made a huge mistake, um, walked it all back, said a bunch of things about the appropriate role of the military, but apparently also drafted a pretty spicy uh, resignation letter in which he said a bunch of, you know, certainly for DC resignation letters, mean things about Trump, true things, uh, but mean things. He ultimately stayed on the job uh, after, you know, consulting with some friends and colleagues uh, and is still the uh, joint chairman. So, um, Quinta, let me let me turn it over to you. You know, what was the gist of the letter, and in particular, what does it tell us about Milley, about Trump, and about their um, let's call it fraught relationship? The letter is a pretty striking document, um, and I think it's also worth noting that, according to the New Yorker, this is a letter that was written after Lafayette Square. You know, there, there's I think a, a lot of folks may have heard there's there's advice that you know people will often get when they're going into government of you know draft a letter of resignation and have it in your desk so that you if you if the red line is crossed or if you see it coming up you know you you have that to kind of pull out and remind yourself of what your principles are this doesn't seem to be forward looking this is very much a backward looking document saying you know i i object to the way that you're using your office so there's some really striking lines in it. I will say as an editor, Millie could have used a bit of an editor here, but that's okay. It was a first draft. It's a first draft. Uh, so, so he says, you're using the military to create fear in the minds of the people. Um, and then saying that he, he feels that Trump is uh, opposed to some of the, the values that the Americans fought for in World War II. And, quote, you subscribe to many of the principles that we fought against, which is a pretty striking statement, given that one of the previous sentences in that paragraph refers directly to Nazism. Uh, well, so Trump did in in Milley's defense, right. Trump literally he did, he wanted did literally to say Hitler in the uh, loyalty of his generals. Trump's Trump's objection to Hitler was that Hitler wasn't cooler, essentially. Right. <laughs> So, no, I mean, it, it's an astonishing document, and I think it's even more astonishing because Milley wrote that document and then, you know, put it in his desk, so to speak, uh, and chose to stay in office. And look, I think there are, first off, I should say there are some really complicated civil military relations issues here that I am not qualified to go into, but I, I do want to kind of, you know, flag that, that there are a lot of theorists who have thought very deeply on the question of the particular obligations that a military official in this role has, whether it is ethical to resign in that circumstance. Um, and so I want to be honest and humble about the fact that that's an area that I haven't studied closely. And so sort of bracket that. What jumped out at me is just that, look, you know, reading this story alongside the truly stunning and sickening story in the Atlantic about child separations, uh, which I definitely recommend that everyone else read. Um, it's by Caitlin Dickerson. What you see, I think, is just a picture of people who went to serve in the Trump administration in the belief that they could prevent a red line from being crossed. And what happens in that situation is that being in that environment, I think, can itself blur uh, distort your ability to identify where the red line is to the point where you look down and it turns out that you already crossed it. 
and that makes it difficult to weigh in on those choices um, because, of course, you know, I'm standing on the outside criticizing Millie. I don't know what it was like in the moment. Millie has all the information, but perhaps doesn't have the perspective that he needs. But to me, a lot of what the story read like, I mean, it's it's incredibly disturbing, but it also reads like Mark Millie saying through an intermediary to the public, look, I haven't lost my moral sense. You can trust me. I did a good job I, under difficult circumstances. You know, I made hard choices, but my moral compass remains intact. And I think that it is, you know, in the same way that the fog of war was for Robert McNamara, it's kind of a, a plea to the public for absolution in a sense. And I frankly, I don't think we have to give that to him. So I want to both come to Millie's defense on the civil military side and to some extent some of the decisions, but I also want to raise a point you got towards the end there, which I actually think is the more problematic part of this that a lot of people are glossing over. You know, I think people raise legitimate civil military concerns when you have a military official who here, by his own account, it seems, because Millie appears to be the source for the story. I don't know who else it could be that would know a lot of this information, or maybe his wife, you know, somebody, somebody very close to him, if not him himself. They came in and said, I thought about resigning. Former Defense Secretary Gates said, no, you can't resign. In fact, you should stay in office and make sure Trump doesn't do anything crazy. And he stayed in office specifically to try and deter and to some extent obstruct President Trump's chosen policy. And that's a point of concern for people who want civil military relations and, and not without reason. I think there is something there to say military officers need to be very careful about deferring to civilian leadership. But I do actually think there's a little bit of a different line when you're talking about behavior that raises major, major legal questions. You're talking about the utmost senior military officials talking to the president. This isn't a field commander who's refusing to implement an order. This is a senior person who has his own legal staff, has his own people to consult on the legality and where the lines are in the law. Variety of people who has been doing this for a very long time and has gotten the surprisingly thorough, if from a particular perspective, legal education that military officers actually genuinely do get, particularly around law of armed conflict issues, um, but also certain domestic authorities issues about well, what the military can and can't do. Milley had every reason to think that some of the stuff Trump was proposing would be really problematic. And then he had an idea that there are certain things Trump was doing that was majorly norm busting. Like at one point, Trump proposed to try and withdraw U.S. forces from a variety of positions around the country in the waning just weeks of the administration, right? Um, at the point where it was clear he wasn't going to be in office this much longer. That's like a major norm departing motion to, to permanently change the U.S. global posture at that moment. And I don't know if there's fundamentally a problem with Milley obstructing or at least raising the cost of taking those sorts of steps if, A, he's willing to accept the fact that Trump may fire him and remove him. In fact, I actually think it's preferable that if you really think a president's doing something wrong, you stay in office and you make them fire you. Because that extra political cost of firing you may be the thing that deters them. I don't have a problem with that. If they really want to execute that policy, that valuable to them, they will fire you and then you have to leave office. Um, But Trump didn't do that step. And I think that makes it more justifiable. The other step, maybe the more damning step for Millie, is he has to accept the possibility he could be court-martialed, right? Which faces serious legal penalty for a military officer ignoring lawful order. That would mean the the awfulness of that order would have to be brought before the judicial proceeding. Um, There's strong presumption of lawfulness when you get an order in the military of Jane of as well, but a defense ultimately is if it's an unlawful order. So Millie has to be pretty confident that he has a defense in a court martial. And and I think for some of these, he probably did, or at least had good reason to think he would. So I'm not sure what Millie did was fundamentally wrong there in regards to his actions at the time. I think it's much more problematic that he's having this story with the New Yorker today. Right. This is a man who's still in office, who's trying to salvage his legacy and having intimate conversations about his service to a president relatively recently. I get the desire to clarify this. And frankly, I think it's fascinating and interesting and probably has public value to the, you know, electorate about what Donald Trump was like in office. But doing it again, relatively transparently, I don't see how this could be anyone but Millie talking to this reporter and then providing this information of peace is kind of, it's a problem for a senior military or government official at this stage about officials relatively recently. You know, this is a conversation you have with a historian down the road. Maybe it's a conversation you have with Congress if they're investigating these sorts of things, certainly, or with other people in the new administration. But I don't think the New Yorker is the place to have that out at this stage of somebody's career. And that, to me, raises a lot more bigger alarm bells than just uh, the civil military relations at the time. I'll just say you can never go wrong in 
overestimating the the self-regard of the New Yorker. I'm sure they believe that they are the place to have that conversation. True enough. The New Yorker, yes, the New Yorker is the place to have that conversation. What I want is I want an Isaac Chotner Q&A with Mark Milley. Look, if you're going to do a New Yorker, just just do it. Will Martha's Vineyard's library invite Mark Miller? To come to you? I think that's the real question. <laughs> look, look uh, uh, according to Alan, Alan Dershowitz, the uh, the raid on Mar-a-Lago was unconstitutional, despite presumably Dershowitz having no idea what the warrant says. So you never know. Well, folks, we are going to have to leave the conversation there for this week. We're going to have lots of time to come back to all these topics. I think they're going to be in the news for a while. But this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to tide you over until our next episode. Alan, what do you have for us this week? So I have a, uh, a double object lesson. Um, so the object lesson I'm going to talk about first is in honor of David McCullough, the great American author and historian uh, who died uh, over the weekend. Um, he wrote a number of amazing books. My favorite of which is his, I think, incredible biography of John Adams. Uh, I don't usually cry at biographies, but man, there are just some passages between him and Abigail Adams near the end of her life. I just, oof, oof. And the whole thing is just amazing. So rest in peace, David McCullough. He wrote amazing books, all of which are amazing. But John Adams, to me, was just fantastic. My second object lesson, which was, which was what I originally intended to talk about, is the city of Asheville, North Carolina. I just recommend it. Um, I am not paid uh, by the Tourist Board of Asheville, North Carolina, though I would happily, happily take that sponsorship deal. Uh, my wife and I went on our first vacation, which we define as a trip without our child. Otherwise, it's just parenting in another place. We went on our first vacation in many years uh, last week for a, a few day trip to Asheville where we hiked and went to the Biltmore and ate unbelievably good food. Uh, it's just a wonderful place. Uh, and, you know, there's a direct flight now from Minneapolis to Asheville, and it's just, it's marvelous. So I um, highly recommend it. Everyone should go visit Asheville, North Carolina. Puente, what do you have for us this week? Uh, once again, I have a really downer object lesson. I am sorry. Uh, it is the Atlantic article that I, I mentioned earlier on this show, which I just wanted to give an extra double shout out um, called The Secret History of Child Separation or Family Separation, excuse me, uh, by Caitlin Dickerson in The Atlantic. Um, it's really just it's an astonishing piece of reporting. It's unbelievably well done. It's deeply upsetting and and damning and the Atlantic did an incredible job putting it all together. So I highly recommend reading it through. Um, it's, it's very long, but it is worth the time that it will take, but definitely, you know, steal yourself before you do. And I will say that one of the things that really jumped out at me in it is, uh, uh, Dickerson's reporting that, uh, from the sort of former and current Trump advisors who she spoke to that her perception is that if Trump were to be reelected in 2024, he would begin this program again. Um, and I think that is uh, worth keeping in mind as we consider his potential candidacy. Yeah, it is a fascinating read alongside the Millie piece and frankly, a lot of pieces in the last two weeks that have been doing these revisiting of elements of the Trump administration's internal operations of policymaking that uh, is interesting timing, to say the least, um, and, and pretty striking and worth reviewing. Um, well, I do have a non-downer of an object lesson. I have a very upper of an object lesson because it is tomato season, one of the greatest seasons in our nation. Uh, if you're not eating tomatoes with every meal, um, you are making a huge mistake. But I have discovered the single greatest food hack I've ever experienced that's tomato related that I somehow did not know about before, and it is life-changing. I'm bringing you, it to you here today. I learned about it. I will give credit to the YouTube series, What's Eating Dan from America's Test Kitchen, host, hosted by Cooks Illustrated. Strangely, they're related, I guess. Editor-in-Chief Dan Souza. It's worth watching short little 10-minute videos about really interesting food and science items with lots of great recipe ideas crammed in there really quick. But he said that one of the chefs at America's Test Kitchen developed this amazing uh, sprinkle seasoning blend to put on top of sliced tomatoes which is salt and pepper. I've been salt and peppering my tomatoes for a long time. Not that surprising. You, everyone should be doing it. If you're not, you're just being lazy. A little sugar. All right, I get it. Sugar is good in everything. I get it. But then secret ingredient number four, what is it? What is it, you ask? What could it be that magically changes these tomatoes? It's cream of tartar. It makes oh, no sense to me whatsoever. That is a twist. It is a real twist. It's something that brings a little acidity to food. You often put it in like lemon flavored desserts and it makes total sense because tomatoes, you want to be sweet, you want to be salty and you want to bring out a little bit of more acidity. And you can literally put this blend on even pretty lame 
supermarket tomatoes and it tastes amazing. And if you put it on the heirlooms I've been jamming into my face nonstop for the last two weeks, it is just like the best thing you've ever had in your entire life. I've literally had a whole tomato as a sandwich with like a little mayo on a piece of toasted bread, vegan is not mayo, uh, for like most of my meals for the last two weeks. And this spice blend has just like made it astronomical. You don't need anything else. And so I strongly encourage you to run out, get tomato however you can, try this on it, and it's just amazing. Where have you been sourcing your tomatoes, Scott? Because we we usually grow a bunch of tomatoes in our garden every year. And this year for climactic or other conditions, we just had the worst tomato harvest. So I am eating far fewer ripe summer tomatoes than I usually like to at this time of the year. Yeah, sadly, the the rodent population of my neighborhood has been getting most of my low-hanging ripest tomatoes. Uh, I'm beginning to try and grab them off the vine but <laughs> before they can get to them, but it's a race between the two of us. Um, so I've been going to the farmer's markets, and they are pretty freaking amazing. If you go there, they're ugly, they're scarred, who cares? They all taste delicious, and it's totally worth, worth the effort. But like I said, with this blend, honestly, even greenhouse tomatoes are going to taste amazing. Ravi unfortunately had to depart before he could share an object lesson, but I actually had one emailed to me, which I will share you, with you, which is he would like to endorse not just Foreign Policy Magazine, of course, of which he is the editor-in-chief, but also the podcast Global Reboot, which everyone should check out for a great discussion of foreign policy and foreign affairs in various regards from the folks at Foreign Policy Magazine. So thank you, Ravi, for that suggestion, and thank you for joining us today. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. But remember that Rational Security 2.0 is like its forebear a production of Lawfare. You can follow us on Twitter at RTL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. And while you're at it, visit our homepage at lawfareblog.com for our show page with links to past episodes, for show notes and other stuff like that, for links to our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, for information on Lawfare's other fantastic podcast series, and lots of other great, great national security and law content. And be sure to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Jay Venables of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan, and once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pacha Howell. On behalf of my co-host, Quentin Allen, and our special guest, Ravi Agrawal, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye!